Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is my favorite national park and I mean we used to hide in the lava tube and scare the tourists and in, at age four saw the Kilauea Iki eruption which was 2,000 feet in the air and you know I had that experience of hot lava and cold air on my back and we were all lined up on a, on a wall at the edge of the crater so I mean that, kinds of, that kind of thing is just a powerful experience. She grew up experiencing some of the natural wonders of Hawaii, and now her job is protecting them for future generations. Suzanne Case, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. There's a tremendous amount of legal and other office work that goes into protecting and preserving the lands and waters of Hawaii. But Hilo-born Suzanne Case, who heads the State Department of Land and Natural Resources, is not only handy with paper trails, she's handy on mountain trails too. In fact, she needs nature in her life. Case is a familiar name in Hawaii. Suzanne's brother is former U.S. Congress member Ed Case, and her cousin is entrepreneur Steve Case, who co-founded America Online, or AOL. Suzanne Case has spent most of her career looking out for natural resources, first as legal counsel and later as Hawaii Executive Director of the Nature Conservancy. In 2015, Governor David Ige appointed her to lead the department charged with managing the state of Hawaii's natural resources. Her deep connection to nature took root while she was growing up in rural Hilo on Hawaii Island. Her father, James Case, took a job at the Hilo office of the Carl Smith & Ball Law Firm in 1951. So I was born in Hilo. We grew up in uh, Keokaha until I was about 10. Okay, I have to stop you there because everyone I've met in Keokaha is a native Hawaiian homesteader. Yeah. Yeah. Your family lived there. So um, there's the Native Hawaiian homestead and, um, and a longer neighborhood going down to the end of the road. We were um, in that neighborhood. We were down towards the end of the road. We went to um, third and fourth grade at uh, Keokaha Elementary. So it was a whole, it was a whole mixture there. And, um, but it, you know, it's a very diverse community and um, uh, very outdoorsy, very, um, the, the road goes right along the water. We lived right across the street from the water. And so, you know, every day we were in the water. It's two steps into the water practically. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, you cross the yard, go down the wall, cross the road and go, you know, walk down and you're there. And so we were there every day, either in the water or scrambling along, along the shoreline. Uh, a lot of, you know, it's all lava rock there. A lot of um, underground caverns and stuff. We had ponds on our property. There were ponds in the neighbor's property. The, we were right across the street from uh, the Richardson's, we call it um, fish pond, which was, which was and is uh, a beautiful fish pond. It's, you could scramble along the wall. There's a makaha there. And um, it's now a, a community center, which is perfect for it. And, um, and why did your family pick that area? Because you have a choice of where to live in Hilo. Yeah, I, I think my parents just wanted a place. We had a, you know, uh, a lot of kids in my family. How many kids? There's six kids growing up. And uh, so we were just outdoors all the time. And I think they just wanted, um, they wanted us to be outdoors. Um, when we were little, my dad would come home from work for lunchtime and have a bite and take us for a swim. Yeah. And then come home after work and we'd go for a swim. And you know, so you learn to swim. We swam underwater on his shoulders, you know, just, just right out in front of the house. And so that part was really neat. Well, your father sounds like he was such an engaged father and your mom. Very uh, much. So they both were very engaged, yeah. Yeah, my mom, uh, so my mom um, actually finished her college when we were in Hilo, when she had, you know, young kids and, and then later her master's when she had more young kids. Um, but, you know, she was at home all the time and cooking and sewing, she made her, made our clothes, taught us to. Taught she had me. a set of twins among the, all yeah, the kids. Yes, they came a little bit later. So uh, I, I grew up really with three brothers and then later on um, uh, a brother and a sister. So um, lots of outdoor energy from, from that group. Did your parents or your brothers make allowances because you're a girl? Not at what? all, no, no. And I was pretty much of a tomboy growing up. Um, you weren't gonna let them yeah. take the lead. Right, I mean, there were a couple of things that, um, 
you know, I thought it, thought it was unfair that they got to do that I didn't. For and example. So, so, I don't know. I mean, part of it was just they were, I had older brothers, so. Um, but on the flip side, my dad used to take me out to lunch starting in preschool uh, on the last day of school because, you know, there were so many boys, he wanted to do something special. And so that was a tradition that continued all through high school, and he does it with his grandchildren now. And my brothers were very uh, jealous of that. <laughs> Which of your um, siblings were you closest to? Probably Ed um, over our whole life. Um, you know, he was really my oldest brother growing up, so I always looked up to him. Um, and, um, um, you know, we're still quite close. Your elementary school was destroyed by a tsunami. Yes, yeah. The old Waiakea Waiakea Kai. Kai. Um, Waiakea Kai Elementary School, right. It wiped out a whole community, and so that's I was there uh, from kindergarten through second grade, and then um, and then we went to Keokaha Elementary School. How much of an impression did that make on you? Very big impression. Um, Waikikai was a, a very um, predominantly Japanese um, mixed community, and Keokaha was a predominantly Hawaiian um, uh, community. Um, so it, it was a big part of my. Um, kind of my grounding in Hawaiian language and music and culture. And um, in fourth grade, played in the, in the Merry Monarch Festival. So I learned ukulele then and, you know, kalao sticks that my friend's grandfather made. And, um, you know, so all my friends were Hawaiian and they got to go to Kamehameha schools and I didn't really understand why I couldn't go there. But, uh, you know, it gave me a real love of Hawaiian language and music and and culture that I think, um, you know, lasted with me. You've had a couple of aha moments. I remember you speaking of one when you were a kid, spearfishing, yes. which changed your behavior. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that time. That yeah. was probably in Keokaha. It was actually in uh, Honomolino Bay in South Kona. We used to go there for vacations, a very uh, remote place, very off the grid. Um, and we spent a week or two at a time every single year when I was growing up in a very, very special place. I knew it underwater better than above water. Where and is it? Honomolino. It's south of Mililii, South Kona. Oh, so that's very south. It's very south, very, um, you know, no roads to it kind of thing. Um, so um, my my dad made um, made our Hawaiian sling spear guns out of, you know, bamboo and, and uh, surgical tubing and electrician's tape. And so, you know, we always had the right size spear for our height and the right length. So, you know, we learned how to fish, and but we had to, of course, uh, clean and eat our fish. And um, so I finally, you know, at age 11 or so, uh, caught my, my first um, veke is what, I, is what I caught. And and then after that, after you got good enough, you had to go for the real eating fish. And so for me, that was, that was uhu. Um, but they were much faster, and I, I never could spear one. And so I just... One day I just got so tired and so frustrated that I just turned and I, I speared a butterfly fish just because I wanted some success. And the spear ripped through the fish and the fish swam away with this gash in it. And I went, oh, that was, that was not Pono. And um, so I quit spear fishing. That was, uh, um, I, I, I knew that I had to, um, I, I couldn't do it if I uh, was going to not do it the right way. So I quit spearfishing. I actually saved up my money and I bought an underwater uh, camera housing for an Instamatic. And oh, I, you shot them in another I, way. <laughs> I turned into an underwater uh, photographer uh, at age 12. And uh, so that, that actually was, it was just a powerful moment for me of, of uh, realizing you have to do the right thing. Suzanne Case faced a culture shock at age nine. Her family packed up and left the country life in Hawaii Island that they loved and moved to the city of Honolulu, Oahu. When I was almost 10, um, my dad's firm asked him to move to Honolulu to build up the Honolulu office. And so um, I was just, we were just between, just finished fourth grade. And so none of us wanted to move. We, we, we first, we thought we were just going to go for a little while. And so we thought that was fine. But when we found out that we were moving for permanent, we just said, and oh, we are not going to go. All, all of us kids, we just, we are not going. <laughs> and then of course we had to, <laughs> but um, it was rough. It was very rough. I always felt like country bumpkin goes to the big city. And, um, 
you know, it was it was rough uh, transition. I went from public school to private school. That was part of the how it was so uh, from a rough Keokaha transition. from Elementary to Punahou. To Punahou, yes, exactly. The, they were just two worlds, and um, you know, Punahou was uh, a great school, but it took me a good maybe four years to really kind of find my place there. Uh, you repeated sixth grade. I did. That was probably the thing that was uh, most influential in in my um, uh, getting settled at Punho and, and turning out uh, more successful because it, it was I, I just for was, social reasons. It was for social reasons. I mean, I was and I was struggling a little bit academically. It was I, I think I was borderline when I when we moved from Honolulu and um, normally maybe they keep you back and so they said, well, um, you know, let's go with it. But after two years, my teachers and my parents recommended I do do that and. You know, that was a hard social adjustment, but really, really good one. I'm I would really think glad. it's hard because, you yeah. know, your, your classmates go on without yeah, you. And yeah, this, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and, you know, and it's awkward, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but it was good, it was good for me. I, I had my first success in school. We had, uh, we were up at Camp Timberline and had to do a study project and, um, and, uh, study plot and I happen to have a spider in my plot and so I ended up really studying that spider for a week and uh, you know got an A plus on my science paper and and I'm like oh that feels good you know it feels good to understand what it takes to like really apply yourself to, to being really good at, at something and that was neat so you know that kind of thing helps your transition. You got so comfortable at Punahou where you'd once felt uncomfortable that you became the first female student body president. I did I did and uh, it was kind of one of those step up things, right? So, you know, you just, I just, I remember thinking about it for a while. I, I had been on a, a, a student council, a small uh, advisory council, and I, I remember just feeling like, again, I, I, sh I should do this, I should step up and, you know, do this kind of service. So I did, I, and I ran, I was elected, and so I was the first female student body president at Punahou. Did you remain an outdoorsy person in Honolulu? Yeah, totally. So we, we moved to Tantalus, um, and so that's an outdoorsy place. So that's the country place. in town. That's, that's the country in town. It's yeah. a very, you know, special place to live in terms of, you know, it's very close to town, but it's, it's, it's in the forest. So we were, you know, we were, again, we were just like, the, the neighbors were much more spread out. So a little more lonely place to, 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 to have that period of your life. But, um, you know, we had, we had kids about a mile up the road and so we would you know find paths through the forest and we had this system of uh, neighbors picking up kids after school at, at the steps at the bottom of the hill and um, so no, nobody does that anymore but it, we were essentially hitchhiking except with people that we knew and so very very independent you know you could come home whenever you want and um, and we, we had a, a great mudslide uh, right near our house. So, you know, yeah. we'd go out, especially in when it was pouring rain, that, was, that would be the yeah. best, and, um, and just, you know, get covered in mud. And, and, you know, that was, you know, some dangerous stuff there, but, you know, you're lucky that you don't get in too much trouble. In addition to enjoying forests on Mount Tantalus above Honolulu, Suzanne Case continued to be fascinated by the reefs and ocean with the help of two popular television shows of the time. I just dreamed about being a scuba diver um, and used to watch um, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau um, and Sea Hunt. Uh, Lloyd Bridges' Sea Hunt in black and white. My parents actually didn't, um, we didn't have television until uh, we moved to Honolulu and then it was very, very restricted. So I always wanted to learn to scuba dive and you could get certified when you're 14. And so as soon as I was 14, my dad and I signed up for a course and we both took it and I was actually much more comfortable underwater than he was. Um, uh, but we got certified and then I started diving and then I found uh, people to go diving with as well and then I I saved up my babysitting money to buy a set of scuba gear, so tank, regulator, uh, pack, um, vest. And um, I used to go diving a lot, um, mostly on Oahu, off of Waikiki, off of Hawaii Kai, uh, off of Hanama Bay, Cockroach Gulch, um, and also uh, Sharks Cove, um, uh, Makua. Um, so, you know, I just loved, loved, I loved the, um, uh, kind of the meditation of being underwater and 
just blowing bubbles and being still. Were you bringing your camera with I the did, underwater house? I did, I did. After graduating from Punahou School, Suzanne Case followed in the footsteps of her father and others in the Case Ohana, including her older brother, former Congressman Ed Case, by entering the world of law. In our family, uh, we have uh, uh, half of us went into law. Um, I would say on my uh, cousin's side, they, they were more on the business side. Um, so, but I think all of us had, um, you know, a sense of like, um, kind of social responsibility, you know, sense that we needed to contribute somehow to, to Hawaii, to society and stuff. And so it just expressed itself in different ways. Uh, you know, Ed's a very much of a public servant in politics and, um, and, you know, Steve obviously is a really fine businessman and, um, you know, all of, all just trying to do something good for the world. Was that said to you explicitly by your parents? This is what you've got to do. This is what we believe in. They had a strong sense of that we had to contribute to society, I guess, is the way we were kind of brought up. I mean, I'm, I can't point to a specific thing they said, but that was kind of a theme going on. You know, you're, you, you need to do something good for society with your life. You chose to go to law school. Was it a real choice? Did you feel, uh, you, you know, know expected I, to? By the time I went to law school, it was a real choice because I, I didn't think I was going to go for a long time. And, it, I, and honestly, I didn't even know, I didn't really understand what my dad did. I, we, we were, he did business, le, business legal transactions. Um, so I was around it all the time. I just didn't really understand what a lawyer did. And I didn't really understand it until I went to law school. But I think by the time I went to law school, I realized that I needed to do something that was intellectually engaging. And um, so it turned out to be a really good path for me. And, and I, I ended up pract practicing law for 18 years, mostly real estate transactions, mostly in conservation. I worked at the Nature Conservancy for 28 years and so, so non-profit and, and in charge of uh, conservation of lands it's a conservation organization um, globally and um, so I I worked there as a lawyer from 1987 to 2001 um, and um, I worked all over the Western United States. I worked in Hawaii. I worked in the Asia Pacific region, places like Indonesia and Papua New Guinea and uh, uh, China and um, Pompeii. Were you negotiating tracts of land? We w so uh, in the U.S. we were uh, very much. We were um, uh, basically doing conservation transactions, so real estate transactions to put um, important pieces of land into um, permanent protection. And so that was, that was just another a switch. I, I practiced real estate law in a law firm in San Francisco for four years after I graduated from law school. Um, and that was, um, that was just straight real estate transactions. And I used to call it one pension fund buys an office building from another pension fund. So it was <laughs> kind of, I saw it as kind of morally neutral work. Uh, whereas when I made the the switch to the Nature Conservancy, you know, I felt good about everything I was doing, but it was still real estate transactions. It was still, you know, problem solving in terms of like how, what are all the things you need to do to get to this point on closing day? We always refer to it as closing, closing instinct. You need to get here by this date. So what are all the things you need to do? But, but that was for conservation. And then in the middle of that in 2001, I was in Hawaii still as lawyer and was asked to be the, the acting director because the previous state director was leaving and I said, uh-uh. Um, I said, there's plenty of people that could do a much better job. But, yeah, I'm perfectly happy being a lawyer. And so the regional director who had asked me just you know, continued to talk to me about it and then I, something just switched in my head and I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And it, it was a real switch. It was a switch from implementing to like figuring out where we need to go. What's the path? Also, to you, get there. you began working with donors too. Very much, yeah. Fundraising, big deal. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, obviously a big challenge for uh, uh, people to do and, and um, very much of a change from, you know, just doing the legal work. But I, you know, my own kind of, um, kind of path in it was just to, just to realize that you know what you're doing is you're you're um, you're 
telling people this great work that needs to be done, and there there are people who want to do this great work. So you're you know offering them a path to to implementing their own dreams as well. So you know once you realize that you're you're talking that language with with a person about what they care about too, then it it's it works. Suzanne Case led the Hawaii program of the Nature Conservancy for 14 years before being nominated by Governor Ige in 2015 to head the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. Case said she had not envisioned herself in that position, but after legislative approval, she stepped up to a new set of challenges. You were chosen after um, lawmakers didn't like a previous selection by the governor who was Carlton Ching but when you uh, came onto the scene many people were saying she she's perfect for this yeah, job you yeah. live the job yeah. and in a sense I, I can see exactly what they mean because you you are somebody who loves the outdoors yes. you live it yeah. and you want to yeah. protect it so it, that's who you've always been yeah it's my I've always been very outdoorsy very um, deep love of Hawaii um, deep love of places and um, and and this problem-solving um, you know the the how you do it and the why you do it. Right, so we, and you had legal skills to boot. Yeah, and so that's been really helpful to me. So all of that is, you know, Deal Honor has a broader mandate than in the Nature Conservancy. We're very focused on protecting our forests and reefs, and that is true also in Deal Honor, but there's also state parks and historic preservation and enforcement and conservation regulation and small boat, boat boating and, you know, a whole slew of things. You have to come up with a decision a lot of times, and the decision is going to affect somebody positively and somebody negatively. So how do you make sure that at least they all feel like they've been heard and then, you know, that you're, you're, you're doing something that really has a, a good public policy base in it? But you know that it'll never be win-win for everyone. That know, somebody will always be unhappy with your decision. That's a very hard thing about it. It's a very hard thing. Yeah, yeah. But overall, our mission is to protect Hawaii's public trust, natural and cultural resources. So that that's just the underlying driver, and um, that helps a lot because a lot of times there is a greater good, and uh, you know, it, it may hurt somebody who would like. A bigger piece of that greater good, um, but you know, you're trying to come up with something that's fair. Do you lie asleep at night saying, "Oh no, you know, I, I'm working really hard in this area, but over here there's coral the bleaching time. going All on, the and time. what's going to go on?" on All the, the time. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's even much more specific. It's like, oh gosh, I need to get back to this person, or um, I need. To, there's an issue here. Something is bothering me here, so we haven't worked this one out yet. And so, yeah, there's a lot of processing, you know. Always feeling like you're not doing enough when in fact you're doing a lot. Yeah, yeah. But again, you know, you have to find that balance too, right? So, um, you know, I'm fortunate I, I live on Tantlis again um, and um, around my family all the time and I'm in the forest all the time. So I have that kind of, you know, ability to kind of step back and take a deep breath and go, okay, what's important to do next? And that's been very special for me. Does it ever take away from your feeling of enjoyment in these places that you have the obligation to protect them and there's a lot to do? I mean, do they, do they become, does that, you know, tarnish them a bit Not at you? all, it, it, it drives it. It, it makes you, you really, and, and a lot of the projects, you know, are, are also very, um, very much driven by the communities that we work, that we work in and so they, they have that intimacy too sometimes for many many generations and so it's it's a it's a motivator it's um it's you 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 just you understand how important it is and um so it's very inspiring what's next after this and this could go on for a while or not yeah, but what's you know after? i think the point is you just have to be open to you know whatever whatever life brings and once you make that leap to um you know leave leave a, a whole career behind and do this, um, do this public service. Uh, you just have to hang with whatever the future brings. So I'm, I'm definitely in this general field for the long haul, and uh, we'll just continue to kind of try to 
do my best for, for Hawaii and the, and the planet. Suzanne Case says that outdoor activities are still her favorite pastime, and they help her to understand her conservation work from inside out. All of her career, she's jumped into her work on site visits, such as on numerous trips to Palmyra Atoll, a thousand miles south of Hawaii for the Nature Conservancy. She likes to get a first-hand look at what needs to be protected. Mahalo nui to Suzanne Case of Honolulu. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Long Story Short on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Palmyra is a place to me, you know, it's both good and bad that more people um, can't get there, but it's the kind of place where if you can see a place like that, you understand it's, it totally resets your baseline. You understand what our world is supposed to look like underwater and, you know, what we've, what we've lost in Hawaii just from overuse. But to me, it's a great inspiration for um, you know, what we can make it look like again if we take care of it.